Having done the brain stem, we are now going to look at the brain stem lesions. And it's very, very important that you understand all the pathways in the brain stem before you attempt this lecture. Now, this first image here shows you the anterior and the posterior aspect of the brain stem and some of the important tracts and the nerves that you see over here. So, here you can see the corticospinal, the corticonuclear tracts. You can see some of these nerves, the third, you can see the fifth. Uh, this part here is the sixth cranial nerve. Then it shows you the eighth and along. Uh, this is the seventh and the lateral one is the eighth and then we have the ninth just below that is the tenth and here is the cranial part of the eleventh you see the twelfth and then the spinal nerves here on the posterior aspect it's showing you uh, you know the parts we've seen in the in the brain stem it's also showing you the tracks the posterior columns how they cross over and become the medial lemniscus shows you the spinal lemniscus traveling upwards then we have the spinal cerebellar tracts and also remember you had this ponto cerebellar tract this ponto cerebellar was how the cerebral cortex came and synapsed on the pontine nuclei and then from there information was sent to the cerebellum so that was the ponto cerebellar tract and this dentatothalamic tract is really from a nucleus within the cerebellum so if this is the cerebellum from a nucleus within the cerebellum fibers pass out and go to the thalamus so this is really that so information is received from the cortex and then it is sent back to the thalamus and then from the thalamus to the cortex so this is the circuit with the cerebellum now we'll be seeing a whole lot of uh, lesions so again when you look at the lesions uh, and try and understand what is happening work it out for yourself and see if it makes sense now let's go to the first one where uh, in your notes if you look at the lesions of the medulla oblongata uh, you will see um, that it's mentioned that there are tumors in the posterior cranial fossa and what really happens here is that if you let's say that we are looking at the let me draw it in this fashion if say this is the foramen magnum and the vertebral canal like this so we have the cerebellum present posteriorly and then here we have the pons the medulla which comes down this way so now suppose there's a tumor in the posterior cranial fossa so something up here so you can see a big mass up here this will occlude the foramen magnum also some sometimes you may have a condition where the cerebellum and the medulla may be pushed downwards so if these two are pushed downwards what happens is that as these go down this way so if the normal position of the pons and the medulla if this is the normal position and this is the cerebellum up here the fourth ventricle if from this normal position they are pushed down so they actually come to lie somewhat like this all the nerves which pass out from here as they go through their various foramina they are going to be actually pulled down so it's going to create traction on all of these nerves and most of these nerves are the last four cranial nerves which get involved so in this picture that's what I'm showing you so here if you look you can see these are the last four cranial nerves so you have uh, the ninth cranial nerve then you have the tenth the ninth you can see supplying um, here all that it shows is it supplies um, it carries taste fibers from the posterior one third of the tongue but it also supplies the region of the oropharynx it also takes part in the gag reflex because it's supplying the region of the oropharynx so if this oro uh, this area is stroked what happens is the afferent fibers are carried by the ninth and they go and synapse in the sensory nucleus of the ninth so this is the sensory nucleus of the ninth in a part really of the commissural nucleus.
from here fibers go to the 10th the motor nucleus of the 10th cranial nerve and from here the fibers go out to supply the muscles of the pharynx so this is the gag reflex which we see the ninth is the afferent limb and the tenth is the efferent limb so that's not shown but you'll see what happens there so these are some of the um, functions of the ninth the uh, tenth cranial nerve you can see as it comes down here it supplies the muscles of the larynx and the pharynx so there it is it also has um, uh, other functions like it supplies a part of the ear uh, on the posterior aspect of the ear up there uh, it carries sensations from there so that's some of the functions of the 10th um, the 11th cranial nerve uh, of course supplies the uh, the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid the 12th cranial nerve supplies the muscles of the tongue as you can see up here and traveling along with these four cranial nerves is the superior cervical ganglion which belongs to the sympathetic nervous system. So anything that involves this area up here is going to involve all of these uh, four cranial nerves along with the superior cervical uh, ganglion and usually it could be there could be a tumor spreading around the base of the skull and uh, this tumor could have arisen anywhere and then passed on up here or there could be a mass up here of present which is because of metastasis and the cervical lymph nodes in this area have you know the lymph nodes up here are swelling and they catch these nerves so these nerves are entrapped so whatever the cause may be when all these four cranial nerves get involved some of the symptoms uh, that you can see is the uh, first is you may the patient may complain of pain behind the ear or in the ear behind or in the ear and this is because of the ninth and the tenth cranial nerves the ninth supplies the middle the mucosa of the middle ear cavity and the tenth as I told you supplies a portion on the posterior aspect of the ear and in fact it is said that whenever an adult complains of constant pain in one year without uh, and you don't suspect or you've ruled out middle ear disease you must suspect a cancer of the pharynx because something up here would could have caught these nerves so that's one of the important things for you to remember uh, then uh, the patient will have hoarseness of vo of the voice because of the muscles of the larynx being involved due to the tenth nerve or entrapment they will also have dysphagia again because of this involvement of the nucleus of the 10th uh, and 11th cranial nerves uh, they will also suffer from something which we'll see a little later down which is known as the Horner's syndrome and that is because of the involvement of the cervical um, sympathetic ganglion here the patient has ptosis which is drooping of the eye and they'll have meiosis which is constriction of the pupil so this is seen in Horner's syndrome along with this what you'll also see is that um, the, when the twelfth nerve is involved you'll see the wasting of the tongue on that side and the tongue will deviate when this person pu uh, pulls out uh, the tongue you ask them to protrude the tongue the tongue deviates to the or to the side of the lesion there is anesthesia of the oropharynx on that side that is because of the involvement of the ninth cranial nerve taste from that side from the posterior one third of that side again will not be there again because of the ninth cranial nerve there is drooping of the soft palate you can see here this side the soft palate is drooping again this is because of the uh, ninth, tenth uh, cranial nerves because uh, they supply the region of the pharynx and the palate. And then, when you do a laryngoscopy and ask the patient, the, the, you will find that the patient will be unable to adduct the vocal folds on that side. So, on that side, the vocal folds are far away, so they are abducted and a little lax. And then, uh, because of the involvement of the eleventh cranial nerve, you can see that the trapezius will be paralyzed. So, here you can see that. Uh, this side the shoulder is drooping uh, as compared to the normal side so you know if you know all 
of the functions of these cranial nerves and the, the ones that you may not remember would be this pain behind the ear or in the ear and that's because of the ninth and 10th. But everything else should really make sense to you. And the Horner syndrome is another new concept we have introduced here. But we are going to be talking about the Horner syndrome frequently in this presentation. So then that again uh, will tell you what happens. So these are some of the things that you will see when the fourth cranial, uh, when the lower four cranial nerves are involved. Now let's go to typical brainstem lesions and we'll begin with what is called the medial medullary syndrome. And in the medial medullary syndrome, you will see that the medulla is supplied by a part of the, vert by branches from the vertebral artery. And just to show you this again, Let's look here, and if we look at the brain stem, so let's look at the ventral aspect of the brain stem. So that's the cross cerebri, and then here we have the pons, and here is the medulla. So here are the pyramids, the olive, and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. This part here would be the middle cerebellar peduncle. Now let's look at the blood supply of this area. So we have the two vertebral arteries which come from below. So here are the two vertebral arteries. And these two vertebral arteries, they fuse the lower border of the pons to form the basilar artery and then this basilar divides into two arteries which are called the posterior cerebral arteries. So just to label this for you so that the diagram is a little bigger, this is the basilar artery, this is the vertebral artery and this one is called posterior cerebral artery. Now you can see that if this part here which is the uh, the pons, this area, uh, sorry, uh, this part here, you can see this part here is the medulla and this medulla gets supplied by branches of the vertebral artery. So you can see on either side the vertebral artery will supply this in this fashion. So any problem with branches of the vertebral artery or within the vertebral artery itself would, uh, would affect this region, the median region of the medulla. Now laterally, there is an artery which goes from the vertebral, which actually curves around like this, and it's going to supply the cerebellum. As it goes around to supply the cerebellum, it gives branches to the lateral side of the medulla. This artery, which is present here, as you can see, as it's going to supply the posterior and inferior surface of the cerebellum, this artery is known as the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So you can see that if this artery, if there's a blockage in this artery, the lateral part of the medulla would be involved. Now let's come to the pons. As this basilar artery travels on the median sulcus, it gives branches on either side and these are called pontine branches. So again, if there's a problem in the basilar artery or in any of these, you can see that this you know, the region along the midline, that's the area which would be involved, which is called paramedian, meaning by the side of the midline. The basilar artery also gives off an artery which actually turns around, which goes off this way, and as it's going here, it goes to supply the anterior um, inferior part of the cerebellum. So this artery goes to supply the anterior inferior. This one was the posterior inferior, so this goes to supply the anterior inferior part of the cerebellum. So if this artery is blocked anywhere here, you can see this artery is supplying the lateral aspect of the pond. So this will result in a problem with the lateral aspect of the pond. And then finally, if this artery, which is the posterior cerebral, this artery you can see quite naturally is going to supply the midbrain. So if there's a problem with the posterior cerebral artery, the midbrain would be involved. So this is basically all the arteries that for now you need to know which supply the different parts of the brainstem.
So let's get back to our PowerPoint. And here we are looking at the first one, which is, a me which is the medial medullary syndrome. And in this, as I told you, that uh, this is uh, the medial part of the medulla. You can see here, this is the vertebral artery. And if there's a problem in the vertebral artery, you can see, I've put a, a little cross there. You can see that the medial part of the medulla would be affected. And if it's affected, when we take a section, this is the area in the medial part of the medulla would, which would be affected. Now, some of the main symptoms that you will see when such a syndrome occurs are, and I've labeled these 1, 2, and 3 based on what is given in your notes. So if you look at the first one, it tell, and you, let's look at this side. So you can see what are the things that are going to be involved. So you can see that this part, which is the, the pyramids, these are going to be involved. This medial lemniscus is going to be involved. So this is the pyramid, the medial lemniscus is going to be involved. And also notice how this hypoglossal nerve, as it's coming out, this is also going to get caught in this, in this area because this is also close to the midline. So these are the three main areas which will be involved. And based on this, let's see some of the symptoms. The first one, number one. So with the involvement, number one, with the involvement of the pyramid, remember this pyramid was going down and then it would, it would cross over on this side. So here, when it's involved here, it has not yet crossed. So it's carrying fibers to the entire body and it's responsible for voluntary movement. So what we will have is when these fibers are, are cut off here, the opposite side of the body will not get any, uh, any supply from up above from the cerebral cortex. So you can see that the upper motor neurons would have been gone and they would have, they would cause a problem on the contralateral side. So the lesion, let's say if I say the lesion is here on the left, the effect will be, the neurological deficit will be seen on the right. If the defect is here on the right, the neurological deficit or the upper motor neuron type of paralysis will be seen on the left side. So we'll have upper motor neuron type of hemi plegia or hemiparesis. Paresis means there's weakness. So this is on the contralateral side. Second, the medial lemniscus is affected, which is number two. The me this medial lemniscus is carrying impulses from this side of the body. And this medial lemniscus is carrying impulses from the opposite side. So again, we would have contralateral loss of tactile discrimination, stereognosis, all of that from the, uh, so there'll be contralateral loss of stereognosis, um, tactile discrimination, vibratory sense from the opposite half of the body. So depending on which side, so if I say the lesion is on, on this side, which is the right side, there would be left-sided loss of stereognosis, vibratory sense, tactile discrimination, and so on. And why? Because of the involvement of the medial lemniscus. Third, it's the, uh, the hypoglossal nerve is involved. So you can see here the hypoglossal nerve is involved. When this hypoglossal nerve is involved, this hypoglossal is to supply the right side of the tongue. This hypoglossal is going to supply the left side of the tongue. So if the lesion is here on the right side, the right half of the tongue would be paralyzed, so it would be on the same side. So there would be ipsilateral paralysis of the tongue, muscles of the tongue, and the tongue deviates to the side of the lesion. And the reason is because the opposite side genioglossus muscle is, is perfectly okay. So let me explain this to you and show you why this happens. So let's take another page. And let's look at the tongue. So if you, let me first draw a side view of the tongue. So this is the tongue. And if you remember the genioglossus muscle, this muscle is a fan-shaped muscle that has fibers which go to the posterior part of the tongue. There are fibers going to the top of the tongue and there are fibers going to the anterior part of the tongue. So when you are asked to protrude your tongue, what happens is that it the muscle contracts from this point. It pulls this part of the tongue closer to itself. So now the tongue is protruded. So the tongue goes out. 
goes out that way. Now when you want to retract your tongue and bring it back, it contracts from here and these fibers act because now they are stretched so they will pull and come back to its normal position. Now when you look at the tongue from the front like this and you have this way. So the genioglossus, when you ask a person to protrude the tongue, the genioglossus of this side contracts and the genioglossus of that side contracts and it causes the tongue to move out. And, you know, the tongue moves out in the center and it's straight. Now let's say that this side is paralyzed. So the muscles of this side are paralyzed. What happens? This genioglossus is overactive. So when it pulls the tongue, when you ask a person to pull the, to protrude the tongue and as the, the muscle acts from behind, that's, as it's acting from this point and it pulls this posterior part of the tongue closer to itself, the tongue actually, since it's pulling the posterior part of the tongue closer to itself, the tongue actually tends to deviate to the opposite side because it's pulling the posterior part of the tongue that way. So when the posterior part of the tongue goes that way, the anterior part moves in the opposite direction. Normally, let's say the posterior part of the tongue goes that way, the anterior part goes this way. And if both muscles are acting, they counteract each other. Can you see that? So when the posterior part goes this way, the anterior part tends to go in that direction. Now both are acting, the tongue will remain in the center because they neutralize each other. But if this side is damaged, so you can see then obviously it cannot go out this way so that's why the tongue deviates to the side of the lesion. So that's what we have when the hypoglossal nerve is paralyzed and that's the third thing. You'll also see that the tongue on that side, on this side the tongue will show wasting. So you know the, the muscles here will look, uh, this area of the tongue would be wasted as we saw in the previous slide. So just uh, to refresh your memory so you see that there is wasting of tongue in this area. So that is, that is what is seen in the medial medullary syndrome and that those are the three things that I want you to remember. So in your tests, you would be given a, an image like this and uh, the lesion will be shown and then you would be asked what are the symptoms that you'll see. So you know, you should basically know your tracks and what is lying where and you should be able to work it out. Let's look at the next one which is the lateral medullary syndrome. And when you look at this, it looks a little confusing and a little busy in the beginning, but don't get overwhelmed by what all is happening over here. Think over it logically. So again, I'm going to follow the order that is given um, in, in your notes. So here, the uh, artery that is involved is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. And here's what it's shown. That's where the uh, cross is. And then just to refresh your memory, let's go back here here so this is the lateral medullary syndrome so notice this area this is where there is a problem so if there if a, there's a problem here this aspect of the medulla is not going to get any blood supply so that's the lateral aspect of the medulla and that's what you're going to see so notice here it's the lateral area of the medulla which is involved so it's this part of the medulla up here which is going to be involved now let's look at all the tracks that get involved. So let's start from here. So notice up here, uh, this, is, this is the area where it gets involved. So notice this is the 10th cranial nerve which is coming out along with the 10th, you have the 9th, the fibers uh, higher up, the, there'll be fibers of the 9th. So that would get involved. Then we have the, up here you can see the spinal nucleus and the tract is involved. And then lower down, you can see the spinothalamic tract right here, the spinothalamic tract. This is the area where it is, which is which becomes the spinal lemniscus. So that is involved. Then uh, when you go higher up, you can see that the vestibular nuclei get involved. Then we also have um, involvement. This part here is a reticular formation. So this reticular formation gets involved. And then you can see here the inferior cerebellar peduncle. There are fibers which go out to the cerebellum. So that gets involved. So based on all of these, let's see what are some of the symptoms. The first one is, as you can see here, number one. So this part, and I've also shown it up here. So just to tell you that it's the nucleus and this area here is the nucleus ambiguous. So that means the ninth and 10th and 11th, all three are in that area. 
So you can see the vagus, the glossopharyngeal uh, nerves and the 11th will be involved. So you'll have dysphagia and dysarthria. That is because the muscles of the pharynx and larynx are uh, involved. There'll be loss of the gag reflex and both limbs will be lost. Remember I told you the 9th and the 10th take part in the gag. The 9th is the afferent, goes to the 10th and the 10th is the efferent. So both parts of the gag reflex are gone because the nucleus ambiguous and then the sensory nucleus of the ninth also is involved. Then number two is the involvement of uh, the spinal nucleus and spinal tract of the trigeminal. So this area up here close by. So the spinal nucleus and spinal tract. So if you remember this was the nucleus and this is the tract which is bringing down fibers like this from this side. So if this area is involved what will happen? It will be from the same side. So it will be on the face, but it will be the same side as the lesion because these fibers are coming from this side of the face. So you'll have ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature on the face because of this involvement. Number three is involvement of the spinal lemniscus. So you can see this is spinal lemniscus. Um, or what is called lateral spinothalamic tract, the same thing. But this lateral spinothalamic tract is bringing impulses from the opposite side of the body. So as they are going here, so if we were to see here, I'm just drawing a very mini figure. So you'll have loss of pain and temperature on the opposite side of the body, but, but face will be on the same side of the lesion. So this is what is called dissociated, sen this is also called dissociated sensory loss because the sensory loss is different. For the face it's on the same side, for the body it's on the opposite side. So that's number three. So that is the contralateral loss of pain and temperature. Then because these vestibular nuclei are involved and these vestibular nuclei go, impulses from here go to the cerebellum and they are responsible for balance. So since the vestibular nucleus is gone, so you have nystagmus, vertigo, nausea, vomiting, all of that are cerebellar uh, symptoms. The next one, number five, this is very important. This area in this reticular formation, this reticular formation is very important because it has the vital centers. So those will also go and these are for respiration and cardiovascular functions. Those will also go. But also in this vital, in this reticular formation, you also have sympathetic fibers which go down and then they go and synapse in the lateral horn of the thoracolumbar region. So these are fibers. So just to explain, so from this reticular formation in the brainstem fibers, these are those descending autonomic fibers which come down to the lateral horn of the spinal cord. So if I was to draw the lateral horn of the spinal cord. This is where they come down and then the fibers go out from here. So now if these are caught, then you can see that again the sympathetic fibers don't go down, no impulses are received for these lateral horn cells and these supply in the upper part, they supply the eye. So again, they are responsible for pupillary dilatation. They are also responsible for keeping your eyelids up. So when that is gone, you again end up with Horner's syndrome where you see ptosis and you see meiosis, the same thing that we saw uh, when we were doing the four cranial nerves. The only difference being that when we saw those involvement of the last four cranial nerves up here, what happens is in this part, it's the lower part. So here it is the it is those uh, nerves which are coming out of the lateral horn. So here these are nerves which have emerged from the lateral horn. And in the lateral medullary syndrome, what I'm talking about is it is these upper descending autonomic pathways. So here in the lateral medullary, that was involved. And in this involvement of lower four cranial nerves, it is these lower fibers which are being involved. Either case, whether it's on the top or whether it's below, you still end up with Horner syndrome. And uh, so that's, uh, that's what you see. That's the number five um, uh, neurological, the neurological deficit numbered five. Then we see um, because of the involvement of the inferior cerebellar peduncle, 
you will see that there are cerebellar problems that will be seen because remember the uh, posterior spinocerebellar tract goes from there, from this olivary nucleus, your fibers going across. And right here, understand cerebellar signs. You will see that there will be gait problems. The person is not able to walk properly because the cerebellum is very important for muscle coordination. And that, when that goes, they, these people are not coordinated. So that's why you get ataxia. You will also see these signs where the finger nose test and something known as dysdidocokinesia. Dysdidocokinesia is when the person cannot do alternating movements of pronation and supination fast. Normally, we can do these movements really fast, but when person cannot do that, then we call that dysdidocokinesia. The reason they cannot do it fast is because the, uh, the muscle coordination is gone and cerebellum is responsible for that. So all the signs that I'm telling you, those are seen in cerebellar in coordination. Fast pointing is when you ask a person to do their finger nose test, even with the eyes open, they cannot touch their finger to their nose. Instead, they go way past the nose. So that is known as pass pointing. So this is what is seen in lateral medullary syndrome. Now notice that the corticospinal tracts are not involved here. So this is for you to work out. Will these, this person have motor involvement of the body? In other words, will there be any paralysis? And I hope you know the right answer to that. And you can see here the corticospinal tracts lying in these pyramids are not involved. So you should understand whether or not there will be motor involvement. Let's look at the next picture which shows you Horner's syndrome. So you're looking at Horner's syndrome on this side. Notice this droopy eyelid that's known as ptosis. And notice also that the pupil is constricted. So that is known as meiosis or pupillary constriction. And the reason the pupil is constricted is because the sympathetic system is gone. So the parasympathetic now becomes overactive. And it, uh, the function of the parasympathetic is to cause constriction. So you can see the constriction here, whereas this is a normal-sized pupil. So that, that's what you see in Horner syndrome. So the Horner syndrome is either the descending autonomic pathway is involved, or a Horner syndrome is also seen if the cervical sympathetic ganglia are involved, as we saw in the involvement in the last four cranial nerves. So any one of these can give rise to Horner syndrome. Let's now move on to the lesions of the pons. And as you can see here, and as I described earlier, you can see this part here, that the basilar artery, that supplies the pons. Its branches, called the pontine branches, supply the median region of the pons. And then we have an artery, which is called the anterior inferior cerebellar. So notice this anterior inferior cerebellar, as it's going laterally, it, sub, it gives off branches to the lateral aspect of the pons. So, and that involvement we'll see in the next slide. So, let's look at this one here, where we see the medial inferior pontine syndrome, where there's a thrombosis in the uh, basilar artery, and all the pontine branches themselves may be involved. So, you can see a cross up here. So, when this is involved, you can see that this median or paramedian region of the pons is going to be involved. So notice what are all the things that will be affected. The first is you can see lying in this region you have corticospinal tracts and corticonuclear fibers are present so these will be involved. In this area you have the medial lemniscus so the medial lemniscus is involved so you can see this corticospinal corticonuclear fibers the medial lemniscus higher up then as this nerve comes out, you can see that this is the sixth cranial nerve. So this abducent nerve that comes out medially. So the sixth cranial nerve is involved. And also present here are those pontine nuclei. So these pontine nuclei which receive fibers from the cerebral cortex as the fibers come from the cerebral cortex. And then from here the pontocerebellar fibers start out. So those get involved. So these are the four main things that are involved. So let's see what are the problems or the neurological deficit that we'll see. When the corticospinal, corticonuclear fibers are involved here, they are coming down and these will be going to the opposite side. So obviously if those are involved, you will have upper motor neuron lesion, 
on the contralateral side. So this is going to be on the contralateral side. The deficit is going to be seen here because these fibers are meant for this side. Then the involvement of the medial lemniscus. When the medial lemniscus is involved here, remember it was carrying fibers from the opposite side of the body. So again, you will have loss of stereognosis and all of that on the contralateral side. So the deficit stereognosis and all of that, or what is called a stereognosis, all of that will be seen on the contralateral side. Then the sixth cranial nerve is involved. You can see here the sixth cranial nerve is involved. This abducens nerve. So the sixth cranial nerve is involved. This sixth cranial nerve goes to supply the lateral rectus muscle. So if I'm if I look at this side, so these are the eyes. So this side, the left side, sixth cranial nerve supplies a muscle which is called the lateral rectus. The lateral rectus pulls the eye laterally. There's a muscle which counteracts this, which pulls the eye medially, and that's called medial rectus. And naturally, because both, even both, when you're looking straight, both muscles counteract their actions. So if this lateral rectus is paralyzed, then what will happen? The medial rectus now is unopposed because the lateral rectus is paralyzed. So on the side of the lesion, the eye will tend to look medially. So they will, this, they will get, they'll show a squint. So actually now the, this is where the eye will be. This is known as medial strabismus. Strabismus means a squint. Strabismus. So because of the unopposed action of the medial rectus on that side, you will have medial strabismus. So, so the eye will look medial. Then we will have, because the pontine nuclei are involved up here, all of this, and these corticopontocerebellar fibers are going to the cerebellum, so again, we'll have cerebellar problems where you will see ataxia or incoordination. Uh, and because of the incoordination, you also have what are known as tremors. And so you'll see tremors in these patients, and these tremors become more pronounced as, uh, as the movement proceeds, and those are known as intention tremors. We'll see more about this when we do the cerebellum, so I'm not going to talk about this here but notice again you'll have cerebellar symptoms because of the involvement of these pontine nuclei and the ponto cerebellar fibers let's look at the next uh, pontine uh, lesion which is the lateral inferior pontine syndrome and here, as I said in the earlier part, this is this anterior inferior cerebellar artery which is involved. As it's going laterally, it supplies the lateral aspect of the pons. And we can see that here. So it's this part. So you can see as it's going across like this, it's supplying the lateral aspect of the pons. So you'll have a problem in the pons in this area. So in the PowerPoint, here you can notice this is the part where the pons is going to be affected. So you can see that there are a lot of, uh, you know, again, don't get overwhelmed by these. Let's go over all the parts which get affected. The first one, as you can see here, this facial nerve and the nucleus are involved. So you'll have the facial nerve involvement with its nucleus. So we, all the functions of the facial nerve that we know of, all of that will go. Then we have the, you can see here next to it, you have this lateral lemniscus. This lateral lemniscus goes, so because of the lateral lemniscus going, you'll have some sort of loss of hearing. Then also at this point, you can see that the spinal tract is present and along with its nucleus, so we'll, we'll have the same uh, symptoms as we saw in the lateral medullary syndrome, very similar, so you will have uh, you know, the face on the side of the lesion, there will be anesthesia. So there will be anesthesia of the face on the side of the lesion, but there will be contralateral anesthesia for the body because the spinal lemniscus is involved and the spinal tract is involved. Since spinal tract is involved, you have anesthesia on the same side of the face. Spinal lemniscus being involved, you have contralateral uh, anesthesia of the body. Then again, we have the 
vestibular nuclei present here in relation to this inferior cerebellar peduncle. So again, because of the vestibular nuclei being involved, you'll have nausea, vomiting, and so on. The inferior cerebellar peduncle and, um, uh, sorry, not the inferior cerebellar, the middle cerebellar, excuse me, the middle cerebellar peduncle being involved, you will have uh, cerebellar problems. This is the pond, so it's the middle cerebellar peduncle. So you'll have cerebellar problems, so all the same as we saw in the lateral medullary syndrome. And again, the reticular formation in this area is involved. So again, you'll have Horner syndrome on that side. So you can see a lot of the sim symptoms, if you compare it, they are very similar to the lateral medullary syndrome because the same tracts are present. So you have the spinal tract is pres the spinal tract and the spinal nucleus of the fifth are present. The lateral lemeniscus is present, the spinal lemeniscus is present, the cerebellar problems in the medullary part, it was the inferior cerebellar peduncle, here we have the middle cerebellar peduncle, and then you have the vestibular nuclei. So these are similar to both parts, so that's why we have the same symptoms as you can see. Uh, some of the symptoms are very similar. So let's go over each one of these. So the first one was and this was specific to the lateral inferior pontine so here we can see that the facial nerve and the nucleus are involved so obviously if the nerve and the nucleus are involved they are going to supply the face on this side so we'll have ipsilateral so this is number one we'll have ipsilateral facial nerve uh, paralysis and this is the lower motor neuron type because the nerve and the nucleus are involved then the other, so there is facial paralysis on the same side. Then the facial nerve carries taste fibers from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So again, there will be loss of taste, which is here. So loss of taste and there will be no lacrimation and decreased salivation on that side. Decrease because the parotid is still okay since it's supplied by the ninth cranial nerve. Then this facial nerve uh, we will have loss of corneal reflex on this side. So the corneal reflex. So if you remember the corneal reflex, so let's take the corneal reflex. This is from the fifth cranial nerve and it goes to the sensory nucleus. From there it goes to the seventh, the motor nucleus of the seventh. And the fibers go out to supply the orbicularis oculi. Now since this is gone, so obviously one limb of that corneal reflex is gone, so the corneal uh, reflex is abolished on that side, and it's this abolish, uh, abolishing of the corneal reflex is both for the normal and the consensual. So if you were to stimulate the eye on this side, then again the reflex would not be seen. If you remember, if the cornea was stimulated on the opposite side, you know, the, there was a consensual reflex. So if you stimulate the cornea on the opposite side, that eye will be okay. But again, you won't see corneal reflex on this side. So both normal and consensual corneal reflex are gone. So then that again is a part of the facial nerve. Hyperacusis means where the sounds are heard more uh, louder than normal and that is because the muscle stapedius is involved which is sup supplied uh, supplied by the facial nerve so because that stapedius is gone so again you will have hyperacusis so th these are all the first three one two three is because of involvement of the facial nerve then the lateral lemon number four is the lateral lemeniscus which is involved and because the lateral lemeniscus is involved you will have contralateral partial deafness because remember the lateral lemeniscus carried fibers from both sides more were from this by a contralateral side a few from the ipsilateral side so if the lat this lateral lemeniscus is gone it's carrying impulses from this ear so there'll be just partial deafness because it still has fibers from on the same side lateral lemeniscus. So that involvement of lateral lemeniscus causes contralateral partial deafness and then the rest of the symptoms are pretty similar as I mentioned to what you saw in the lateral medullary syndrome. So the spinal nucleus and tract being involved you'll have ipsilateral on the face so there'll be suppose the lesion is on as shown here is on this side so hemianesthesia of the face 
and because of involvement of the spinal lemniscus the the other half of the opposite half of the body is is gone so this again is dissociated anesthesia so there's contralateral loss of pain and temperature from the body but ipsilateral from the face then the vestibular nuclei being involved and the middle cerebellar peduncle up here the middle cerebellar peduncle being involved you'll get cerebellar symptoms of nausea vomiting vertigo and um, all those uh, voluntary movements with tremors all of this will be on the side of the lesion and you'll have horner syndrome which is this number 9 because this reticular formation the descending autonomic pathways are gone so number 9 is this in this area you'll have uh, involvement of the descending autonomic fibers so that gives rise to horner syndrome so you can see from 5 to 9 they are pretty it's pretty similar to what happens in the lateral medullary syndrome because the same tracks are really being involved so you really don't have to memorize this thing is just a question of understanding and seeing what tracks will be present uh, excuse me sir So now let's look at the facial collicular syndrome and in this syndrome it's usually due to a glial tumor and astrocytomas which is uh, a tumor of the astrocytes these are common in childhood and they involve the pons and they involve this area where the facial colliculus is so you can see when this is involved what you'll have is that the sixth nerve nucleus will be involved and along with that the seventh cranial nerve seventh nerve on that side will be involved so let's see what are some of the symptoms so 1 to 3 that you see will be involvement of because of the facial nerve so because of involvement of the facial nerve we'll have ipsilateral facial paralysis since the nerve uh, since the nerve itself is involved so facial paralysis on the same side loss of taste from that side uh then there will be loss of lacrimation and decreased salivation and hyperacusis so this is similar to what we just did earlier so this is all because of the facial nerve involvement and of course also the corneal reflex will go so the corneal reflex is also gone on the same side so all of this is because of the facial nerve and then we have because now the sixth nerve is also involved here so and then the lateral rectus is paralyzed on that side which means the medial rectus becomes overactive so again here we get what is called medial strabismus so this is why it's very important to know what the functions of the nerves are so you can see uh, then it's easy for you to work out what will happen so this is what is seen in facial colliculus so you can see that 1 to 3 that's because of involvement of the facial nerve and number 4 is because of involvement of the sixth nerve nucleus so here here you can see number 4 is that so those are the symptoms that you see in facial colliculus syndrome let's now go on to midbrain lesions and in the midbrain lesions uh, vascular lesions are there are two of them one is called the weber syndrome and also known as the medial midbrain syndrome this is seen in the anterior aspect so you can see in the anterior aspect we have involvement of the third cranial nerve and we have involvement of the crust cerebri so let's see what happens because of the involvement of the third cranial nerve now the third cranial nerve supplies most of the muscles of the eye except the lateral rectus and there's another muscle which is known as superior oblique the third does not supply these two so now because of the involvement of the third all the other muscles of the eye are involved so then you get what is known as ophthalmoplegia and obviously it will be on the side of the lesion lesion so you get what is called ophthalmoplegia and that means the muscles are not working properly so there is an incoordination with the muscles you get lateral strabismus so this is the opposite so you get lateral strabismus and that's because i told you the third supplies all except these two so if you remember in the eye and let's say this eye the lateral rectus takes the eye laterally the medial rectus takes the eye medially 
Now, the medial rectus is supplied by the third cranial nerve. So, if this is damaged, the lateral rectus becomes overactive. So, the eye looks laterally. So, you get lateral strabismus and that's because the sixth nerve is intact. The third, if you remember, also carried parasympathetic fibers up here with the, from the edingo westphal nucleus. And these parasympathetic fibers were responsible for causing constriction of the pupil. Now, since those parasympathetic also get caught in the lesion, you will, the sympathetic becomes overactive, so your pupils become fixed and dilated. So those are the first three symptoms which are all, uh, they are seen because of the involvement of the third cranial nerve. The next is because of the involvement of the crust cerebri, so you can see that in this middle part of the crust, the corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers will be involved. So you will have contralateral because these go down and in the medulla, they are the ones which are crossing. So you can see they'll go down that way. So if they are involved here, the opposite half of the body will be paralyzed or there will be weakness. So you will see upper motor neuron lesion on the other side. Next. Because of the involvement of the corticonuclear fibers, now there are corticonuclear from here, these are going to go down to the 7th, to the uh, 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th. So all of them will get involved, but the ones that you can actually see visibly are involvement of the 7th and involvement of the 12th. So these corticonuclear fibers, most of them go to the 12th cranial nerve of the opposite side. So if this is gone, this 12th cranial nerve, the tongue on the opposite side is not going to um, get its nerve supply properly. So you will see wasting and paralysis of tongue muscles on the opposite side. And then you will have facial uh, paralysis, again upper motor neuron and again because of the corticonuclear fibers and these will be seen on the lower half of the face. So if you remember the face and the facial nerve nuclei and I explained that to you in when we did the brain stem. So in upper motor neuron lesion because the upper half of the face has a dual supply, it's only the lower half of the face which, which, um, which suffers. So you'll have upper motor neuron paralysis of the lower half of the face. Now from this don't think that the corticonuclear fibers only to the 7th and the 12th are affected. They are affected to all the others too, to the 9th and the 10th and the 11th also. But the only reason I'm mentioning 7th and 12th is because this is what is visible. The neurological deficit is very clearly seen here. So you will see, for example, the 7th, you'll have paralysis of the lower half of the face. In the 12th, you'll have paralysis of the tongue on the opposite side. So you can see that quite visibly. Um, if you were to look at the 11th and the 10th, you can see that the soft palate on the opposite side, even that would droop and, um, you know, then the gag reflex, um, again, there'll be a problem there. But that's not so important. So, um, you know, that's why I only mentioned the 7th and the 12th. Let's look at the Benedict syndrome, which is involvement of the midbrain, and this occurs a little more posteriorly. It still occurs in the paramedian region, but it's a little more posterior, so we don't have involvement of the crust cerebri and the corticospinal tracts. What is similar is that the third nerve is still involved, as you see over here, but now what you have is that you also have involvement of the medial and the trigeminal lemniscus because this area gets involved. So you have the involvement of the medial and the trigeminal lemniscus. And this nucleus present here, the red nucleus, this also gets involved. So let's see some of the problems or the neurological deficits that we'll see. So because the third nerve is involved, the first three symptoms are very similar to what you saw in the Weber syndrome. So you'll have ipsilateral ophthalmoplegia, you'll have ptosis. That ptosis is because, the, in case I forgot to mention, it's because the levator palpebri superioris is involved. And that is important for elevating the eyelid. Now if that, that is supplied by the third cranial nerve, so if that is damaged, then obviously there is ptosis. So ptosis is seen also in Horner syndrome. In Horner syndrome, it's because of a a smooth muscle which is called the Muller's muscle which is present in the eyelid. That muscle is paralyzed and you have ptosis. In this, the levator palpebri superioris is paralyzed and that's why you have ptosis. 
then you have lateral strabismus, I've already explained why, and then you have pupils fixed and dilated. So this is very similar to Weber syndrome. Let's see what are the other accompany, accompaniments over here. Now here, because of the involvement of the medial and the trigeminal lemeniscus up here, you have contralateral loss of stereognosis, tactile discrimination, etc. because these are carrying impulses from the opposite side of the body. And then because the red nucleus is involved and this red nucleus is, is very important in the control of coordinated muscle activity and this red nucleus has connections with the cerebellum. So there are cerebellar connections. So because of this you will have involuntary movement of the limbs and uh, you will see that uh, the person, you know, has sudden movements of the limbs which they have no control over. But there is no motor involvement for skilled movements because the corticospinal tracts are spared. So you can see the corticospinal tracts are spared. So voluntary movement is, there is no problem with that. Now in this kind of a lesion, the fourth nerve sub escapes because if this, even if this occurred uh, lower down where the fourth nerve was, remember the fourth nerve goes this way. So it crossed over, it went this way. So because it's going on the dorsal aspect, the fourth nerve never gets involved in this kind of a lesion. If it is involved, the lesion is a little higher up over here and you will see because the fourth nerve crosses over, it is going to be the contralateral superior oblique muscle that is going to be uh, damaged because the fourth nerve of this side, suppose this instead of third, this was the fourth, what will happen as it comes out, it's going to go to the Let me just show it to you again. So if this was the fourth nerve of both sides, you can see as these nerves are coming out, they cross over this way. So this nerve goes to this side and this nerve goes to that side. So if this nerve is damaged, it's going to be the superior oblique of the opposite side which is going to be involved. So because the nerve crosses over dorsally. So that's what, uh, you know, in your notes in italics, it tells you if the trochlear nerve is involved, the lesion is seen and the opposite um, superior oblique. So that is what is seen. So that finishes the brain stem lesions and while you know you don't have too much as far as notes are concerned it's very important that you understand what will happen uh, if a particular area is damaged because in your tests you will get uh, up an image and you know you'll get an image something like this and so you must know which nerve it is what areas get involved and then you know you could get a question all of the following symptoms will be seen except or which of the following symptoms will be seen if a lesion is occurs where it is shown in the image so you know it's very very important to look at these images really really carefully and make sure you draw them on your own and you you know you understand each and everything that is mentioned in your notes.